we'll give it a few minutes to allow um, a few more people to join and then we will start. Dr. Franzman, you will be first to go. So thanks for being here. Uh, Amy will actually present, be presenting. Okay, okay. Should I start my slide deck? Yes, you can set it up. Thank you. Okay. So, um, Amy, just like the first session, you would have about eight to 10 minutes to present and then we'll um, okay. open it up for, um, for some questions. Great, can you see you. my presentation? Okay. You can proceed in the interest of time. Thank you. Okay. Are you able to see my presentation? Yes, we can. And it's not in presenter mode. It is actually. Can you see my notes? Or no, can we you can't see, see your notes. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm going to be presenting today about some of our work at InterHealth International and some ways that we could potentially collaborate. Uh, so by 2030, the world may lack 10 million health workers. Just like this empty bed shows, without health workers, healthcare doesn't happen. Um, I'm Dr. Amy Finnegan. I'm the Deputy Director of Data Science at IntraHealth International. And in this talk, I want to share some innovative ways that we're using data science at IntraHealth to increase public health impact and some potential ways that we could partner together. So if you haven't heard of IntraHealth, we're a global health nonprofit that's worked in over 100 countries since 1979. We partner with governments and local collaborators to improve the performance of health workers and strengthen the systems in which they work so that everyone everywhere has the health care that they need to thrive. <clears throat> IntraHealth's cross-cutting approaches to improving global health uh, include health workforce development, strategic information, and digital health. We've worked across a number of different health service areas, including HIV, maternal, newborn, child health, and family planning, global health security, non-communicable diseases. And um, we partner with countries and NGOs to more effectively provide high quality health services for communities everywhere. We're working towards a future of sustainable locally led development. So I wanted to share um, some of the things that we've been doing. Um, we're really proud of our impact across 100 plus countries and that 100% of our country leaders are from the countries or regions where they work. Um, since uh, to date, we've worked with a total of 6,600 local partners worldwide. If you're from any of the countries that we work in now, you can see the dark or orange areas here in Africa. I think there's probably at least one person from many of these countries where we're currently working and even those where we've worked in the past, um, there might be opportunities to collaborate, to um, use data set sources that your organization has access to combined with our data science um, skills to, to form a, a, con a, a consortium for a funding opportunity so that we can turn those that data into insights that can help improve um, public health impact. I sit on the digital health team. Um, IntraHealth, I think, is really known for health workforce, but also we're the pioneers in digital transformation for the health workforce. So we have created uh, open source tools that support health information systems, including IRIS, which is a health workforce planning software, mHero, which allows um, two-way messaging, um, OpenCR, which is a tool that can uh, uses data science and machine learning to merge uh, uh, client names across different databases. So these tools can be used in a health information system. They could also be used in data science work that you're doing if you have lists of individuals and their health records and you need to deduplicate those lists. Uh, Ready is our rapid, efficient, data-driven implementation approach, which allows us to look across our portfolio uh, at our program impact, but can also support our program teams to implement, um, implement their projects and take funding further by tracking their um, performance monitoring plans digitally. And then lastly, Gopher, which is the global open facility registry. So a, a lot of people who, who work in data science know that 80% of the work 
work is really um, um, working with the data, wrangling the data, getting it in the shape that it needs to be for the analysis. So we have a number of tools that can support um, that kind of data analysis. And the Center for Digital Health, we are small but mighty and diverse. So we have uh, software engineers and data scientists across Tanzania, Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia, and Namibia. I'm based in the US East Coast. And then my counterpart, Dana Achiavati, who's the Deputy Director of Digital Health is also based there. And our Chief Operating Officer, uh, Philippe Gno is based in Switzerland. So we do have a lot of local expertise and the ability to work in person on um, data science projects. I'm now gonna go through a few of our projects. I'm gonna highlight two of them today and then talk about uh, the data science approaches that we've employed. So this one is not from Africa, it's from Central America, but I think the example will be really relevant for people who work on HIV service delivery. Um, we've been managing the USAID-funded HIV care and treatment project for the last five or six years. Um, the goal is to, ex uh, <clears throat> Sorry, it's in Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, and Panama. Um, IntraHealth and our partners are focused on reaching these clients with high quality stigma-free services and work together to enroll and retain as many people living with HIV as possible on treatment. Um, for those uh, who don't work in HIV, um, HIV is now a chronic long-term condition. More than 20 million deaths have been averted since the introduction of widely available ART therapy. And with these new drugs, um, undetectable viral loads from consistent medication adherence mean that the virus is untransmittable. So ensuring the millions of clients on treatment continue to come to their appointments for life to get and take medications that can stop the spread of HIV is really a growing challenge in this field. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how machine learning approaches can help. So in the status quo, interventions usually occur after the client has already interrupted. So you have your appointment and then uh, two weeks later in our Central America project, we get a list of um, the people who didn't show up at their appointment, and then we're able to start are intervening. But by applying machine learning prediction approaches, we can actually um, predict uh, before the appointment who is not going to uh, come in, and then we can intervene before they interrupt. So interruption and treatment is actually uh, well suited to machine learning approaches. Uh, it's a big problem, but it has a low prevalence. For those working in machine learning, you know, it's it's very difficult to predict an outcome that has a low prevalence. So you can't really do it well with traditional approaches. So this type of problem really lends itself to machine learning. Um, for example, about half a million PEPFAR clients experienced interruption in treatment in quarter three of 2023, but that was really only 2% of overall clients. So we've been using machine learning approaches in our Central American cohort to predict who is going to interrupt in treatment based on their past behavior using the electronic medical record we have available there. And then we can assign these individuals uh, risk categories, so red, yellow, and green, so that the health worker who sees this client in front of them um, knows that they may be more likely to interrupt and can provide either psychosocial support or you know, reschedule the appointment, um, uh, provide multi-month dispensing to really ensure that clients are able to stick with their um, ART regimen and keep their viral load suppressed so that the, the virus is intransmittable. <clears throat> the other project I want to talk about is in Uganda, so it's an Africa project. Um, in this project, we combine multiple sources of data, including from the IRIS system that I mentioned earlier, which has data on staffing and absenteeism for health workers at, our, at the sites we were working in in eastern Uganda. Um, uh, we had data on retention and HIV care at 12 months. And our question is, uh, what's the optimal ratio of lay workers to HIV clients on treatment that could maximize retention? So it seems like a really simple question, but we needed to combine four different databases together to be able to um, answer this question. And we applied a, a machine learning approach to test multiple ratios. So on the next slide, I'm going to show you some of the ratios um, just to 
to give you a preview, a ratio of 100 to 1 would mean that each lay worker may be responsible for 100 HIV clients. Um, they would be playing the vital role role of a mentor mother or expert client who helps newly diagnosed individuals cope with their diagnosis. They may be following up with people who miss their appointments or ensuring community drug delivery. Um, so needless to say, they play a critical role in ensuring retention in HIV care. Um, but we wanted to know, you know, how many um, uh, clients could one lay worker handle and uh, in, improve, uh, get the highest level of retention across our cohort so that we could better staff to, to improve retention. So we essentially uh, just tested all of the available ratios in our population. And you could see that uh, the optimal ratio was about 50 to one. So uh, along the x-axis here, all the ratios in the data and the y-axis is our 12 month proxy for retention. Each point represents the predicted retention retention for a certain ratio. So there seem to be low returns to decreasing the ratio below 50 to 1 and steep negative returns to increasing the ratio above 50 to 1. And then of course there were some, some outliers. So the way we put this into practice is that we were able to map the ratios at each of our sites, and then we could gain insights into how to dynamically redistribute lay workers. Um, for example, we could reallocate some lay workers from green sites that were near to sites that had um, yellow ratios in the 50 to 80 range. And then we could turn some of those yellow sites green um, and to really be able to maximize retention. So that's just another way that we are using machine learning and data science to um, increase the public health impact of our programs. So some collaboration opportunities. I think that one way we could collaborate with um, other NGOs or research organizations on the call is that you might have an idea where you're creating a, a proof of concept, where you're using machine learning to create some risk prediction tool or, or something, you have a, a great idea to improve health service delivery, um, but you want to partner with us and uh, one of the projects that we work on, for example, in Uganda, um, we could, uh, if you if you had funding to to work on this study, we could uh, work with our chief of party there or in the local um, the local population to to launch that proof of concept study and help you evaluate it and whether you should be um, whether it is effective and can go to the next level. We could also, if you already have a proof of concept and something that's working well, you could partner with us to help turn the results of your data science project into program impact. So rather than doing a proof of concept study, we could partner with you and your funding organization um, to take the results of that data science project. Maybe you're predicting you know, who's going to get malaria, maybe you're predicting um, you know, interruption in treatment in, in Africa already. We could partner with you um, to use that approach in our program and to study it and to um, to make sure that we're getting public health impact. Uh, we can also leverage our expertise in data collection, analysis, interpretation, and impact evaluation to support your objectives. Um, in an earlier session, there was an NGO that mentioned that they have all of this data that um, they they need support on understanding what machine learning or big data approaches could be applied, um, how to interpret it, and how to turn it into um, into potentially an intervention or to get insights from that data. If you have funding or you find a funding opportunity that that will pay you your organization directly to analyze that data and you want to contract with us uh, for services, uh, kind of working with us as a consultant, um, we can share that knowledge with you um, and build your capacity to use that data. And then lastly, you can rely on our broad and deep connections in 100 plus countries and commitment to locally led development. I think that we kind of stand out among NGOs, international NGOs, and that we work with a lot of local partners. Um, we have deep connections across many countries, and we're one of the only organizations that really has this data science um, department within the, the digital health center where we can partner with you and different um, consultancies. So I'm really glad to meet a lot of you today. Thank you for coming. This is my contact information and I look forward to hearing from you. Hi, Dr. Finnegan. Thank you so much for um, your presentation. 
I will open up for questions now. Comments, contributions are welcome. Please either use the chat or um, you can raise your hands. I see a few hands up. I will go with um, Sophia first. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gifty. And great presentation, Amy. I really enjoyed it. I just have a question on the first project um, you talked to us about in um, South uh, America. I was wondering um, what was the success rate of the risk prediction for those that you know were were identified as not coming back to the clinic, uh, and based on your experience in implementing this project, do you think this is something that is scalable? Are there any challenges like um, taking it to other settings? And then just a little bit about the government. Um, how is the government embracing such um, uh, such a project or a new technology? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. I would say we're still in progress in the Central America project, so it's not complete yet. We're still working on some of the prediction, but, but I see you're based in Nigeria. Um, there is, I can't think of the project name right now, but Palindrome is the company and then Japigo is implementing an HIV project in Nigeria where they're actually have the proof of concept and they're rolling it out in, in their program and they're studying it now. So by September, we should have some results on whether the intervention is actually working. So that's really exciting. Um, sorry, we don't have any results of our own to share quite yet, but um, yeah, definitely look them up. Thank you. Okay, there's another hand up. Um, Dr. Malker. Yeah, th thank you, um, uh, Amy, for the presentation. Um, I'm, I'm Malker again. Uh, I'm from Tanzania, uh, MDH. So I was much intrigued on the, the, I think you have been working in, you're in Tanzania actually, and the, you're on the uh, digital health. So um, digital the machine learning. So I was just in, would like to know about the digital health right now. Uh, are you doing the digital health as part of the M Health, or is a uh, digital health in a, in a, in, a, in which scenario do you apply the digital right now in Tanzania? Yeah, thank you for your question. We have um, a project in Tanzania. It did end a couple years ago. It was the Tohara Plus project on voluntary medical male circumcision. And that project uh, is actually really cool. Um, the they, they were going on for five or six years and they were using district level population data that was just the total population at the district level. And then they had a mobile VMMC um, uh, van mm -hmm. that, that they could use and then they would go out to um, health facilities and, and train health workers and perform circumcisions. And what they learned is that after they kind of got to all the, the low hanging fruit, they weren't, um, you know, the, the health workers were standing around, right? They would go to where they thought the population was and uh, there wouldn't be anyone available to circumcise. So when we partnered with that project, um, the data science approach we used there is that we found um, granular population level data. So Facebook actually has one by one kilometer population um, density maps in Tanzania and across Africa, kind of across the world, I think. We were able to take that data and then uh, estimate how many men were uncircumcised. And then we were able to subtract from that the men that PEPFAR had circumcised to get a more granular estimate of where the uncircumcised men would be. And then we overlaid that with HIV prevalence data mm -hmm. that we got from the um, Global Burden of Disease study. So the data science and mHealth approach that we used in, in Tanzania was really a geospatial approach with some demographic analysis where we were able to take this kind of uh, crude or rough estimates of population and then enhance them with data from publicly available sources so that our teams could see um, where exactly they needed to go to reach their targets. Um, and then we could take all of the down to the ward level. So instead of at the district level, we were able to go down to the ward level and then we could sort those um, so that the high prevalence um, HIV areas with the most uncircumcised men were at the top of the list 
excuse me, and then we could help our, our teams kind of decide in what order to go to those wards to really maximize the impact of the project. Um, and then I think AFIA Plus is the local organization that we have in Tanzania. So you may know Lucy and Furu. Um, Ali Shaban is there. He's uh, been with us a long time working on Iris and Gopher and OpenCR. So you might know some of our staff from those projects. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Finnegan. I Thank you. I'll um, invite, like to end this um, your presentation and then invite Dr. Annette David from Tanzania Human Genetics Organization to present. And then if we have some more time left, we will um, come back to the questions. Um, you can, Sebastian, I did see your question. Um, I would like for us to hold on to that and ask, um, have Dr. Annette David present, and then we can come back to um, answering these questions. Thank you. Yeah, hello everyone. Thank you for having us. Uh, I had a trouble with a uh, voice from my laptop, so I had to join from mobile, and I'm going to try and just present from mobile. If it doesn't work, we'll see what to do. I hope everyone can see the slide. Yes, we can. Okay, okay. and I hope it's not, it's not too small. So my name is Yanis David, and I am representing Tanzania Human Genetics Organization. It's a professional society for people and entities who have interest in human genetics in Tanzania. Uh, so, yeah, one of the pictures not visible. Our story starts back in 2017, where some of our founders were attending the African Human Genetics meeting, and they realized there were only two Tanzanians in the meeting, but they knew back home there were many more people who were doing human genetics research. And when they returned home, that's when they mobilized a few of us, and together mm -hmm. we came up with a Tanzania Human Genetics Organization back in... Uh, 20, back in 2019. Um, another catalysis for formation of Tanzania Human Genetics Organization was uh, Africa Society of Human Genetics. They have a habit of hosting their annual meeting and conference in a different country each year. So in 2018, the meeting was in Kigali and we bid to host the meeting in 2019 in Tanzania, in 2020 in Tanzania, and we got accepted. And then COVID happened. But by 2021, that's when we hosted the 17th Conference of African Society of Human Genetics. And this was really the beginning of the society and really kick-started the activities. Um, one moment. It's a bit difficult to get the next slide. Ah, just have to be... Yeah, um, I may just have to speak really. The organization has several um, objectives and the objectives are divided into four areas. The first area is training where we aim to build capacity for uh, human capacity for human genetics. But also another, another area is in advocacy where we create awareness in human genetics and related matters in Tanzania and Africa where relevant. And another area of uh, work is in diagnostics, where we try to create and support creation of diagnostic capacity in Tanzania. The other area is research, where we advocate for research in human genetics, but we also try to conduct research in human genetics in Tanzania. And then the last area is in therapeutics, where we try to catalyze for development of therapeutics, which are based in human genetics or utilize human genetics knowledge. And we uh, managed to launch the organization officially in 2019. And we wrote a paper about the launch process. And between 2019 and now, we also catalyzed formation of the Zanzibar Human Genetics Organization. It's a sister organization uh, in Zanzibar, which is part of Tanzania. 
As already mentioned, we have four areas and focusing in uh, training, starting with training. We have been able to conduct a few trainings and some of these trainings were virtually, some of these trainings were in person or hybrid. And we partnered with other organizations such as the H3 Africa and H3 Bionet in hosting workshops and trainings. And uh, we also target secondary school students, high school students, and try to create awareness or, or training basic skills in human genetics. One of the trainings we are really proud of, we have been engaged in uh, training in diagnosis of few rare diseases. And this year we just finished the training for the second year in a row. And looking at advocacy, we try to create awareness about human genetics in the country. And we do so through multiple platforms. We engage um, with the general public on social media, on mass media, with radio and television interviews. We have written a couple of articles on matters which relate to human genetics that are of interest to the public. But also we do high level uh, advocacy at the government level, ministries and other entities that um, are responsible for in one way or another enabling or regulating human genetics in Tanzania. And one of the areas where we've been really active in terms of advocacy is in rare diseases. And we also have awareness campaigns which target the general public, but um, other awareness campaigns such as the Rare Diseases Day, which is a global event. We participate and try to engage the government. And in 2020, we had the then vice president, now the president of the country as the guest of honor. And some of our activities have really been impactful. For example, our advocacy in rare diseases uh, in partnership with other advocacy groups have led to introduction of a homeschooling uh, framework for the from the Ministry of Education. Now children who are suffering from rare diseases who cannot be in a normal class, they can uh, get education from the, their, the comfort of their home, I would say, and still uh, attain certification at any level they wish. So that has been one of the fruits of um, uh, awareness for advocacy, awareness and advocacy. And at high level also, we try to influence policy. We have written two policy papers, one focusing on rare diseases in Tanzania and another one focusing on rare diseases in the Sadiq region. And they are now, we hope that whoever is trying to fight or combat rare diseases at a national, regional level, they can find a place to start. Um, regarding research, uh, we haven't been very active and research is quite expensive, especially human genetics research. But we have two main projects of interest that we are currently uh, building partnership for and fundraising. The first one is Tanzania Human Genomic Variation Project. Tanzania is such a diverse country with over 120 ethnic groups. And some of these are Bantu tribes and uh, other uh, small two groups which speak the, uh, come from the Khoisan tribe or branch from the southern of Africa. So there is a lot of uh, genetic diversity that remains uncaptured. And we hope that by having, um, uh, by characterizing the human genomic variation in the country, we may be able to find out what makes these groups differences, but also to find out what are the markers for disease or markers for health. Another project is on rare diseases. And we are really trying to first establish the burden of different rare diseases. There is no such data, which makes it very difficult for policymakers or for the government to enact interventions. Uh, in regards with our diagnostics, we are trying to bring together different stakeholders who are um, interested or who are relevant for diagnostics in different uh, areas of human genetics. We are trying to also map the capacity in the country. For example, we have the Moha Genetics Laboratory, uh, different uh, research centers different hospitals, private and government hospitals. So we are really trying to map the capacity and also try to introduce uh, some human genetics diagnostics tools that are common and affordable. And there's some diagnostics that are going on, such as uh, HLA typing for kidney transplant, some molecular diagnostics, but these are more at the chief government chemist laboratory where uh, they're not at commercial level, not everybody can just walk in and access. So we're also trying to uh, improve access. 
So for therapeutics, we haven't been able to work much on the area, so we don't have much, but we really love to connect uh, and see how we can partner and work together on all these four areas, one of the areas or the rest, any of the four, five areas that we mentioned. And on the screen, we have some contact details and how to find us on social media. Thank you so much and so sorry for uh, the breakdown in terms of uh, yeah, presentation, but thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. David. We are open for questions, contributions and comments. But David, first thing, could you um, post your contact email in the chat so um, people can reach out if they desire to after this? Sure, sure. Right away. Okay. Any questions, Sean? Anybody? Mm -hmm. I've posted some email addresses in the chat. Okay, thank you for that. Anything you're looking from um, partners specifically that would enhance your your work? Yeah, um, so of course everybody is looking for financial support for funding, especially for the two projects, but also we are looking for partners in terms of uh, capacity building, which can be infrastructure, but also in terms of trainings to build human capacity. They can be virtual, in person or hybrid. And we are always looking for opportunities to join hands in, uh, in advocacy. For example, now we are part of the SADC Health Cluster Coalition for Rare Diseases. So we try to join hands to really push for our awareness of rare diseases in the SADC region and trying to create an impact. So in, in another area is therapeutics and diagnostics, trying to improve the situation in the country. Most of the diagnostics right now is done out of the country in terms of sequencing. And some happens in the research context and not uh, commercially, not available to the general public. So that's an area also where we are looking for partners to try to establish that capacity in the country. Thank you. Any other questions? So, um, Dr. David, while you're on, I'm, I'll say for people who had questions for Dr. Finnegan as well, um, this is a time you can also throw those questions to her and um, Dr. David if something comes up as well. So i uh, keep us um, open for a few more minutes for any extra questions for both presenters. And if um, there's none, we could go into the other other breakout streams to participate there. Any more questions for either Dr. Um, Finnegan or David? Okay then. We are one presenter short. We were expecting three presenters. The last presenter could not um, connect due to internet reasons, um, connectivity. So we do have a little time left. I will encourage us to join the other breakout sessions to participate. And thank you so much, Dr. Finnegan and Dr. David for your presentations. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks for Thank joining you so everyone. much, everyone. Okay. Bye -bye.